on the common link theory CLT by Fahad Al Hamoudi. Yunbol finds this is not confusing because he assumes that the CL should appear at about the fourth level of transmission, being responsible for fabricating and disseminating the hadith. But in this case, there is more than one person that could potentially fill this role. Yunbol wouldn't have been confused if he acknowledged the traditionist method of analysing Isnad, which, is, which allows one to discern that all of these potential common links refer to a higher authority, namely a companion or the Prophet himself. These two cases show us how the Isnad seem unworkable to Yunbol because he could not locate the common link, which prevented him from understanding their structure. Moreover, he generalised his rejection of such structures whenever he found himself incapable of understanding the isolated Isnad. According to Yunbol, executing diagrams of Isnad bundles on transparencies and simply placing one bundle on top of another, or on top of a third one, on top of a fourth one, etc., just because the repetitive matins supported by these bundles show a verbal simila similarity so as to prompt the conclusion that they must constitute in reality one saying which is historically ascribable to the Prophet with just a few negligible variants is method methodologically wrong and leads nowhere. This would mean that the proper heed is no longer paid to the individual strands between the CLS down to the Prophet. In this remark, we see that the structure that Jumbo found difficult to comprehend is a simple explanation of how muhaddiths view the transmission of the hadith. Yunbol's opinion as to the faultiness of the traditional Muslim methodology was thus not based on sufficient ground. In fact, it contradicted his own definition of mutawatir, which allows for more than one bundle for the same hadith with different wordings. Having analysed the main arguments of Cook, Yunbol, Cook and Yunbol, Harold Motsky comes to a quite different conclusion regarding the CLT. Motsky challenges Shat not only by criticising his approach, but by providing an alternative framework where hadith are treated as subcategory. Cook, as we may recall, identified two main strategies in dealing with the Islamic tradition. The first strategy, i.e. that it is impossible to reconstruct historical facts on the basis of Muslim sources and that we are on safer ground to rely on non-Muslim sources, Motsky declares to be unconvincing. He makes another critical point against Cook Patricia Cohn, and Patricia Cohn and others who took rejection of the Islamic tradition so far as to reject the authenticity of the Qur'an, doubting that the Islamic tradition can be historically a reliable framework for reference for the Qur'an. This approach, however, contradicts what has already been established in Western Islamic studies, for according to Motsky, Even scholars such as Ignaz Goldzihar and Joseph Schatt, who regarded most hadith reports as fictitious and without any historical value for the time which they purport to reflect, did not contest the view that the Qur'an went back to Muhammad, and they regarded it as the most reliable source of his life and preaching. This inconsistent position has been abandoned only recently by the followers of Schatt's radical opinions on the hadith, such as Waynesboro, Michael Cook, Patricia Cohn, Andrew Ripping, uh, Gerald Horting and others. They doubt that the Islamic tradition can be a historically reliable frame for the reference of the Qur'an. As for the second strategy, Motsky agrees with Cook's contention that the CLT is applicable to other fields of Islamic studies, but credits Shat with first suggesting this possibility. Although Shat had developed his ideas on the basis of legal hadiths, he did not limit his theory to this type of tradition, but thought it was applicable to other thought sorts as well. Shat's views concerning the hadith impressed most Western scholars, and in the decades following the publication of his, books, his book, scepticism became a major factor in the Western study of early Islam. Motsky even goes so far as to contradict Watt's assertion in his Muhammad in Mecca to the effect that Shat's theory is not applicable to the Sirah, stating that Watt's poor methodology in answering this question and in dismissing Shat's objections to the hadith as not being applicable to the Sirah material was not convinced has not convinced critical minds and has brought upon himself reproach of being gullible. Motsky also applies new terms introduced by Yumbo. A clear example is found in his study of Hadith of Al-Bara, where, uh, where he uses Yumbo's terminology when stating that Abu Ishaq is the common link in this Isnad bundle. He also notes that Israel, one of the three transmitters from Abu Ishaq, is what Yumbo would have described as a partial common link, a PCL. 
However, Motsky's application of the C CLT differs from that of Schatt. For whereas Schatt did not consider a companion as a common link, Motsky unexpectedly does so. In his study of the murder of Ibn Abi Luhay, uh, uh, Luhay Cake, it's spelled A B L hyphen H U Q A Y Q, he identifies Ibn Unais, a companion, as the common link. Stating, we conclude from this that the common skeleton of the version described to Abdullah ibn Unais possibly goes back to him, the common link of the Isnad bundle. Despite his adoption of Shat's theories, albeit with slight modifications, Motsi cannot be considered a prominent uh, proponent of Shatian ideas. A general criticism of Shat's work is to be found in Motsi's Origins of Islamic Jurisprudence, as well as his Hadith Origins and Developments. In his article, The Collection of the Qur'an, Motsky criticizes the CLT in particular and concludes that the explanation of the CL phenomenon as a result of forgery has several shortcomings. Quote, Firstly, these types of forgery are only imagined. Admittedly, there are some cases which prove that such forgeries sometimes occurred, but there are no indications that this was the general manner in which Isnads developed systematically. Secondly, the assumption of forgery seems very manufactured in our particular case i.e. in the Isnad bundle described above. Regarding the Hadith about collecting the Qur'an, because it posits that a great number of transmitters and collectors of traditions must have used exactly the same procedure of forgery, although a number of other methods were theoretically possible. Thirdly, and most importantly, a comparative study of the matans of all the transmission lines reveal a close connection between matan and Isnad. Al-Hakim's statement that all hadiths narrated by Bukhari and Muslim have no common link at any level of Isnad supports Motsky's first critique on the proportion of Isnads that have a common link. Having clarified Cook's, Yumbol's and Motsky's interpretations of the CLT, it is equally important to discuss the opinions of other scholars who have been influenced by Shat's theories, including S.G. Vasey Fitzgerald, who believed that Shat had a very strong reason for his view um, at about the time that the great Sunni law schools came into existence and before the appearance of the six great collections of traditions there were deliberate forgeries of traditions uh, and this was on a very large scale. Vasey Fitzgerald advocates that new evidence revealed by Schatz research raises the strong suspicion held by previous scholars to the level of proof. Moreover Schatz's method was summed up by Horani as an application of Ignaz Goldziher's general criticism of the traditions of the early history of Islamic legal theory. This history was largely based on specialized use of traditions. Hurani attributes Shat's conclusions and detailed theories to those of his predecessors, which he saw as standing up well to the tests of time and difficult to overthrow. Other scholars seem to agree with Shat's findings, even though they have neither been tested nor confirmed. Brown, for instance, mentions that the critical scholars like Shat view the details constituting the Prophet's Sunnah as not based upon historic authentic recollection, but as fictitious and intended to support legal doctrines. Another example can be found in a comparative study of Shat's methodologies with those of traditionists of Aaron Layish, who repeats Shat's disapproval of the method of criticism of traditions as practiced by Muslim scholars because it was purely formal in nature. Layish explains that Shat saw this technical criticism of traditions as being irrelevant to the purpose of historical analysis, since most of the legal traditions were inauthentic and only placed into circulation by the traditionists themselves from the first half of the second century onwards. The validity of Shat's conclusion, and by extension that of Goldziha, seems to be accepted by Layish without qualification. Shat's theories and assumptions about the traditions seem to present present in Mitter's writings as well. The underlying assumption accepted by Mitter is that the Muslims in the first century were not interested in legal issues and that Islamic law was poorly developed. In contrast to what the Hadiths would have us believe, therefore, in Mitter's opinion, Hadith reporting events and legal opinions from that of the period are likely spurious. They are said to reflect the opinions and methods of latter jurists who, in order to strengthen their own doctrines, ascribe them first to early lawyers, then to successors, then to the companions, and finally to the Prophet. Even though the CLT is not literally stated, it is obvious here. Mitta states that this idea about the Islamic tradition is taken from Shat. He says, In this view, as a rule of thumb, the traditionists of the Prophet are considered to be the youngest ones, not the oldest. 
This chronology was elaborated by Joseph Schatt in 1950, who based himself on the theories of Goldzihar. It has been accepted since then by most Western Orientalists. Ehrlich Ulrich Mitter Nevertheless, when it comes to practice, Ulrich Mitter misinterprets Schatz's theories, especially as the following example shows. Her explanation of the CLT, Ulrich, Ulrich Mitter writes, The Salim Hadith is mentioned by Abdul Razak, Ibn Abi Shayba, Sahnoon, Ad-Darimi, Ibn Sa'ad, Shafi'i, Al-Bayhaqi, Ibn Qadama. It is going back to five authorities who lived at the end of the first century. These authorities are Muhammad ibn Sirin, who died in 110, who is the only CL in the first generation of transmitters. Amir Sha'abi died in Kufa, 103. Abdullah ibn Shaddad al-Hadi, Kufa, 81. Abdullah ibn Wadi ibn Khiddam, Medina, who died in 63. Urwa ibn Zubair, Medina, died in 94 or 99. Furthermore, there are three Medinese transmitters of the first decades of the first century. Az-Zuhri, Abu Zinad, between 130 and 132. Abu Tawala, Abdullah ibn Abdurrahman ibn Ma'mar, who died in 134. In Mitter's examples above, there are five transmitters at the same level who lived at an early time and had heard the hadith from the companions, companion Umar. Yet one of them is described as the earliest common link because these two transmitters narrated the hadith via him. Based on the Mitta diagram and the structure she described, the true common link here is the companion Umar who spread the hadiths to those five authorities. In this case, with all five of the transmitters having heard the tradition in question from one companion, the CLT does not apply. Certainly, Shat would have considered the hadith as supporting his theory since the Isnad reached the companion's level as explained previously. Mitta's diagram reflects Motsky's modified interpretation of the CLT, yet Mitta, probably in an attempt to align with Shat's theory, refused to consider the possibility of Umar as a common link. However, her diagram and description of its early, uh, a description of it clearly indicates Umar. As such, since Mahabadim Sivirin and the four other followers who transmit the hadith all attributed it to Umar. The last two examples uh, of, uh, of supporters of Shat's finding discussed here are MJ Kista and Jeanette Wakin, a student of Shat. Kista's main concern is with the intellectual content of the hadith and as such does not mention the CLT. He states nevertheless the few traditionists the few traditions reviewed in his paper clearly demonstrate the fluidity of certain religious and socio political ideas reflected in the early compilation of Hadith, as already provided by Ignaz Goldzihar. Stay tuned for Jeanette Wakin.